On the 6th of December 1921, the document known as the Articles of Agreement was signed by the Irish delegation to the treaty negotiations in London. The agreement was brought back to the door for ratification, and almost immediately a split began to emerge over its terms. On January 7th, following several days of debate and increasingly acrimonious, the Dáil voted in favour of the treaty by 64 to 57. Eamon de Valera resigned as president and Arthur Griffith was elected by a majority of two votes. De Valera and the 57 deputies who had voted against the treaty formed a new political grouping called Cumann the Pólachtha. There were roughly 72,000 members of the IRA by the beginning of 1922. Historian John Dorney noted that the IRA was an effective occupation of the country and in charge of uh, what law and order there was. I'm just going to put this out of the way. And there was a lot, the British army was confined to barracks and uh, in charge, the Royal Irish Constabulary, uh, the RIC, had been disbanded the previous year. By March 1922, the IRA's 19 army divisions had split into 11 divisions for the Republic and eight for the um, Free State. The divisions who were against acceptance of the treaty swore to maintain the existing Republic, the one that had been declared in 1916 and 1919. By and large, IRA units in Munster and most of Connacht were opposed to the treaty, while those in favour predominated in the Midlands, Leinster and Ulster. The pro-treaty volunteers formed the nucleus of the new National Army. A convention in the Mansion House, which was forbidden by the provisional government, uh, anti-treaty officers of the IRA rejected the authority of the pro-treaty leadership of the IRA, and they elected their own executive with 16 members. You can see them listed here. And Liam Lynch was elected as uh, assist as IRA Chief of Staff, while Ernie O'Malley was uh, selected as his assistant. And they appointed a seven-member Army Council. The new battalion headquarters, or the anti-IRA headquarters, was selected was Barry's Hotel in Gardner Row. On the pro-treaty side of the IRA, Collins was followed by the majority of his headquarters staff, who had been in Dublin with him through most of the Anglo-Irish War. Although several of the Dublin divisions opted for the anti-treaty position, the members of the squad and the active service units followed Collins, possibly out of personal loyalty as much as any belief in the free state that would emerge. The mainly Dublin-based uh, Irish Citizen Army replaced their commander, uh, James O'Neill, who had been very close to Michael Collins. John Hanhoutry was uh, had declared for the Republic, as Oren Fox described in uh, his history of the IRA. He said, although no, the, the, the citizen army had no part in the negotiations, it was clear at a very early stage that the treaty would not satisfy its claim. The citizen army fell back on the proclamation of the Republic made in 1916, signed by their leader, along with other signatories. This document, with its generous democratic spirit, served as a general statement of aims in the absence of incisive criticism of the treaty from their own special standpoint. Now, the divisions about the terms of the treaty and the, both the Dáil and the IRA were clearly marked. But most people in the country were more concerned with bringing about a peace that would allow better day-to-day -day conditions to prevail. 
because remember this was at the end of a long period of violence and fighting. Ireland was predominantly a rural economy, apart from the industrialized areas in the Northeast, and they were now part of the new state of Northern Ireland. It was poorer than the rest of the United Kingdom, with the GDP per capita that was just 62% of Britain's. The Committee of Inquiry into the Resources of Ireland, which had been appointed by the Dáil in December 1919, reported in 1922 on the strengths and weaknesses of the economy, particularly with regard to food supplies and natural resources. The well-being of the country depended on peace so that there could be some development. In the decades leading up to independence in 1922, the major difference between nationalist and unionist politicians and commentators in terms of the Irish economy related to the prospects for Irish prosperity outside the United Kingdom. Nationalists argued that Britain had always overtaxed Ireland and they pointed to the government mismanagement that had led to the Great Famine. Free trade was blamed for the lack of industrialization in the country, uh, particularly at, outside of the Northeast, as agricultural produce was Ireland's main export, but that was balanced with manufacturers that were imported from Britain. On the other hand, unionists argued that the home rule for Ireland would lead to economic disaster and they feared that a nationalist government would be protective, uh, would be protectionist, would raise tariffs and generally create obstacles to trade with Britain, which was Ireland's primary market. Um, you can see here the crowds anxiously waiting the result of the vote because uh, people really did just want to have a state that would represent them, but that also would be aware of the need to, for proper governance. That was one of the uh, issues raised by unionists because they said they were concerned about the quality of governance that would result from an independent Irish state as nationalists had little experience or expertise in fiscal matters. The Labour Party had adopted a neutral position on the terms of the treaty, as did most trade unions in the country and various other independent bodies. But even before the treaty was debated in the Dáil, Labour representatives met with the leaders of the pro and anti-treaty parties in December 1921 in an effort to mediate between them. In his recent study of uh, Thomas Johnson, leader of the Labour Party in the Dáil in 1922, Shea Cody quotes from Johnson's speech to that special Congress on election policy, which was held in February uh, 1922, which he says illustrated the majority view within the ranks of organised labour. Johnson said, those whom we trusted and who were best able to weigh the forces, material and moral on either side, arrived at a certain conclusion. They decided that the terms of peace were the best that could be obtained in the circumstances. And Cody argues that Johnson probably was anti-treaty, but that he accepted the viewpoint that the British weren't going to let Ireland have anything more at that time than was uh, had been uh, agreed in London, but that, um, like Collins, he was prepared to play a waiting game. The report on the meeting that was issued, uh, along with the yearly report of the executive of the at the twenty eighth annual meeting of the uh, Irish Labour Party and Trade Union Congress. Um, that was held in August, and the, as you can see here, the uh, two reports were included in the documentation. It was clear that the majority of delegates shared Johnson's opinion. There was some criticism of previous decisions to abstain from running election candidates, 
But Helene Maloney, speaking as a member of the Irish Women Workers Union, reminded the attendants that the labour movement should be primarily concerned with the foundation of the Workers' Republic. And uh, she had said, we see the inadvisability of having an army not morally responsible to the people or whatever state it is. The only thing that should obtain is an army of citizen soldiers where every soldier has the right to refuse to fight when he likes and when he likes and to not obey the command of any authority, civil or state. There's no use in talking about peace until we have some foundation for it. Labour as a whole should think out some policy as an antidote and an antidote to militarism and the provision of means in the direction of bringing about industrial action to put an end to the war. The chief thing ought to be the founding of a workers' republic. Now, on 22nd of March, 1922, the senior, senior IRA officer, Rory O'Connor, declares that the Irish Republican Army would no longer obey Dáil Éireann because they considered it to have lost its legitimacy to govern by ratifying the treaty. On 14th of April, O'Connor led 200 anti-treaty IRA men up into, under his command in an occupation of the four courts, in total defiance of the provisional government. A standoff ensued for the following three months between the provisional government and the anti-treaty force. Sean Lamas, who a former Taoiseach, as we know, was then age 23, and he was the barrack adjutant of the Four Courts Garrison. He issued passes to the garrison, which were stamped on the back with the wax seal of the Lord Chief Justice of Southern Ireland. I don't know whether he was just using what material was to hand or whether he had a strong sense of humour. But it also reflected the fact that between 1920 and the occupation of the four courts in 1922, the office of the Lord Chief Justice and the official justice system had been competing with the Republican court system set up by the Dáil as part of the determination from 1919 to establish alternatives to the state structures set up by the British. And the British court system had been brought to almost to a standstill because of the success of the Republican courts. O'Connor and the garrison in the four courts wanted to set off a new armed confrontation with the British, which they hoped would bring down the treaty. And you, it would, the idea was to unite the two factions of the IRA against their former common enemy and restart start the fight to create an all-Ireland uh, Irish Republic. Um, you can see some reports here of the initiative that was proposed by uh, the Labour Party and the trade union movement, but I'll go into that in a minute. At the time, the British Army still had thousands of soldiers concentrated in Dublin, awaiting evacuation. Winston Churchill, the Secretary of State for the Colonies in the British Cabinet at the time, urged Collins to ensure that the force was ejected from the four courts, claiming it was a breach of the treaty and in contempt of the law. He was to keep up the pressure until the bombing of the four courts on 28th of June. In the meantime, the Labour Party had organised a conference in the Mansion House on 20th of April in a further effort to bring together the Free State and Republican supporters and avert the increasing danger of violence. They proposed that a plebiscite on the treaty should be held so that citizens could vote on its terms. But this idea was rejected by politicians on both sides. It had previously been agreed that there would be a general election in April, but this was deferred until June. The Labour Party had agreed at their conference in February that they would contest this election, unlike the previous ones. They had hoped to concentrate on economic and social issues, including the catastrophic unemployment situation, but the tension between the pro and anti-treaty elements made this impossible. 
Tom Johnson met with the leadership of the four courts occupiers, but he was unable to persuade them to abandon their course of action. On 20th of April, the Labour Party issued a statement drafted by Johnson denouncing the increased militarization of politics. The statement criticized the apparent abandonment of the democratic program, which was supposed to be the agenda for the first Doyle and had indeed been co-written by Johnson. A general strike was called for 24th of April, opposing the militarization from both sides of the military and political forces. The strike would last for 15 hours from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And according to press reports later, resulted in, I quote, the complete paralysis of all the nerves of industrial, commercial and social, social life, unquote. Uh, I'll just go back to the slides that I had gone over. You can see there that um, these are uh, the Irish Independent and the Freeman's Journal reports, but um, they reported in great detail on the statement by the Labour Party, which wouldn't have been the most common approach they take to political issues, um, and uh, urged that people would follow the strike in order to um, make it very clear that the ordinary people were not happy with um, this usurpation of their dislike of militarism. So the Freeman's Journal on the 25th of April reported that all ranks of labor assembled in their thousands in O'Connell Street yesterday it's only recently been renamed, and gave unmistakable proof of their detestation of militarism. The resolve and the resolve that the voice of the nation must prevail. By midday, the thoroughfare was, ther was filled with a vast concourse, large numbers having walked in from the suburbs. A note of unanimity and enthusiastic endorsement of the spirit which called the demonstration marked the proceedings. They also quote um, Lord Mayor Lawrence O'Neill, who had strongly condemned the recent firing during midnight in Dublin, declaring that such diabolical transactions were causing things that would draw tears from a stone. The report went on to say the gathering resolved itself into three huge meetings, uh, which were addressed by men prominently identified with the Labour movement. So um, the whole of O'Connell Street was filled with people and um, there were three separate platforms erected from which speakers uh, were able to deliver the same message. Um, before the meetings in O'Connell Street, a large number of men, chiefly members of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, uh, had gathered at Liberty Hall and they'd marched up the quays and uh, to the meeting place led by um, the ITGWU band, the Finton Lawler band. They also had lots of banners, and you can see some of them here. This is um, a still from uh, the Pathé Newsreel, uh, which is uh, available to see on the, uh, the Irish Film Institute archive player. But the fact that Pathé covered the day, it was clear how important this was considered to be. Now, the newspaper report went on to note that Eamon O'Carroll, chairman of Dublin Workers Council, was present at number one platform, where he was supported by Tom Johnson, uh, Thomas Irwin, secretary of the Plaster Youth or Plasters Union, Tom Farron, secretary of the Dublin Workers Council, among others, and of course. Uh, uh, distinctly not a man, Sissy Cahillan, who at the time was president of the Distributive Workers Union, which later became Mandate. Most unusually, all of the major newspapers instead agreed with the stance against militarism. Not that they would be unusual, it was that it was unusual they'd be against militarism, but that they agreed with each other. 
However, the Belfast newsletter did run a report that concentrated on the occupation of the four courts. It, as you can see here, it was issued at five o'clock from their London office. And it was, uh, which was just before the strike would begin an hour later. And it basically echoed the position adopted by Winston Churchill, uh, that following the occupation, um, to allowing the occupation to continue was contempt of the justice system, but even more frighteningly was a step towards a red republic. The article named Collins as the Kerensky of the Irish Revolution. And the writer went on to say that the Bolshevists who are behind the whole business are preparing for the next step. Um, anyway, they, they got one part of it right in that certainly you know, they were preparing for the next step, but not quite in the way that it was being portrayed here. From the platform, Eamon O'Carroll read a resolution, which he said was being submitted sim simultaneously at all three platforms and at platforms around the country where there were other gatherings and rallies. This resolution was that this mass meeting endorses the recent manifestos of the National Executive of the Labour Party on the military and political situation and pledges its support for any action that may be considered necessary to achieve the object desired. And uh, O'Carroll reminded the gathering that four years previously, and this is a picture from that general strike against conscription, that the Irish Labour Party had demonstrated in a similar manner when, as he said, a foreign power attempted to impose conscription. And he said that should a home government attempt to enforce conscription or militarism upon the Irish people, they would protest just as vigorously as they had in 1918 and as successfully. O'Carroll went on to describe how the spirit of militarism was causing fear as no man's life or property was safe. They could not walk through the streets without danger of being killed by military motors. And certainly all of the papers carried um, so many accounts at that time of uh, armed men carrying deadly weapons, presumably to shoot down their fellow countrymen and driving around the city in trucks that were very reminiscent of how the Black and Tans used to uh, operate. One report said that by night, fusillades of, bus, of bullets ring out and men, women and children in certain areas were compelled to leave their beds and sleep in hallways. Neither Beggar's Bush, where the leadership of the pro-treaty was based, nor the four courts, referring to the anti-treaty IRA forces who occupied the buildings, accepted responsibility. John Dorney noted that the anti-treatyites carried out a series of bank robberies in Dublin and elsewhere in the days after the four courts occupation. And this was to pay for their now full-time garrison and that they requisitioned at least £50,000 from the Bank of Ireland alone. There were also unclaimed gun attacks on pro-treaty posts at Wellington Barracks, Beggar's Bush Barracks and the Bank of Ireland headquarters on College Green, where there was, quote, intense firing, um, unquote, over a series of nights. The general strike against militarism was successful in bringing the country to an effective standstill on the 24th of April 1922. Unfortunately, it did not succeed in changing the attitudes of the armed forces on both sides of the debate about the treaty. The politicians refused the Labour Party's suggestion to hold a plebiscite and said the general election scheduled for June would be the decider. We now know, of course, that when the majority of voters supported the treaty, any chance of peace was destroyed when British artillery was used to bomb the anti-treaty occupiers of the four courts on 28th of June. On the following day, Free State Army troops stormed the buildings. 
killing three, wounding 14, and taking 33 prisoners. This set off the battle for Dublin that lasted until the 5th of July, as they pursued those who had managed to escape from the four courts. And of course, the ensuing civil war lasted until May of the following year. But the fallout was felt in Irish political life for the best part of the next century, and sadly still raises its ugly head, but not maybe quite so often, uh, especially as we now have both sides of the argument, if you could be that simplistic in government together. But these are some of the posters that were issued at the time. And as you can see, uh, the pro-treaty side were arguing for what they said would be stability and um, protection for industries by tariffs if necessary, which of course is what the unionists have predicted. To deal with your own problems in your own way, to hold in peace, to acquiring justice, to pursue happiness. Uh, a big claim, So, but they were saying basically vote for the treaty. The, this one is much more stark. There's no argument. It relies on the visuals to make the case. And um, oddly enough, Collins at the time was clearly preparing to arm Republicans in the North and nationalists uh, who were unhappy with the partition. But uh, he was, of course, as we know, executed before it could get more developed. However, uh, I'm not going to go into that on this occasion, as my historian residence colleagues and I will be giving two lectures each on the Civil War in June of this year in the libraries in our administrative areas. Dates and times for the different lectures will be announced in the next month, but I'll be speaking in the Central Library, in Charleville Mall Library and in Fibsborough Library and the lectures will be in person, but like this, also recorded for online viewing. I hope to see the, this audience at one of the venues, and I thank you for listening. Just a reminder of what happened on the 28th of June, and as the uh, artillery lent by the British government, or forced on the hands of the provisional government, whatever way you want to consider it, uh, was used on the four courts. You can see it here in the background as the building was literally in rubble. So watch this space for further information about the uh, Civil War lectures. Thank you again for listening.